Okay, uh, I think I know quite quite a few of you. I'm Oscar Nomalain Carlberg, the Executive Director of Open Forum Europe, where I think time has worked. I've been active in Brussels for 20 years, working with open technologies and um, public policy in different forms. Wherever they intersect, we try to be there. Um, so today, uh, we're going to have a discussion, different perspectives we, um, on the Cyber Resilience Act and um, um, the progression of the negotiations, etc., uh, where uh, it, it, you know, its potential effects on uh, free and open source software, but perhaps more importantly, whether those effects on free and open source software could mean for the European economy and society to be fair. So, since we're already five minutes past nine, uh, let me give the podium to Jose Carlos uh, Delgado Gomez, the cyber uh, attaché of Spain, uh, just to open this event and then we'll smoothly transition into the panel. Thanks, Jose Carlos. You have the microphone. Thank you, Oscar. Um, thank you, Oscar. All of this will be edited in post production. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this event and for chasing me to, to, to be present today. Uh, as, as from the beginning, I had some agenda problems. In fact, I apologize uh, beforehand because I will have to run uh, after this intervention a little bit more. Uh, I have another meeting. And I'm so happy to see so so much uh, nice people that are already know working on this uh, around. Uh, I won't talk about the importance of uh, open source software and free software. Uh, that, that's on your side. I'm, I'm a convinced one the, that of the importance, and, and I don't I don't care much about the the numbers. The, if, if it is at 80 percent or whatever, uh, I just I'm sure that that we need to keep it as safe as possible from side effects from the legislation. So that's my personal view. And from an official view, uh, you invited me probably to talk about the, the side effects of CRA on open source. And I just came to send a message that uh, we are working in the council with all the stakeholders are being involved in this proposal from the beginning, the commission also. And I also know very well that the parliament is on that also. And you should rest assured that uh, no, no harmful side effects uh, will come out from a legislation uh, like CRA. So Benjamin also knows uh, very well that we have uh, some fruitful debates on, on, on this. And, and I always say the same. Uh, your input from the stakeholders is crucial. And you have to, I mean, I don't need, I don't need to tell you. You have to let us know because we are uh, dealing with such amount of papers and lines and paragraphs and words that at some point uh, it's very difficult that all of us miss something but probably we don't have the same angle so if you don't have in the bunch of people that is working there is a lot uh, the right angle on a specific word then the legislation won't be as perfect as we want it to so mm, this is it i think this is a collaborative activity for from everybody and the words are going well. I cannot give details on the exact wording to make uh, all the audience more uh, assured that, that the, the words are going in the right way, but uh, just um, my word. Uh, the, the things are going well, the negotiations are going well, and, and we need this. And the side effects on the open source, uh, I don't expect any. Uh, so thank you for inviting me. And others. And I, uh, I talked to Jose Carlos yesterday. There's a time, one, two questions. Maybe somebody <clears throat> has some, some questions, direct channel into to the council within the limitations of what he can say. Uh, any questions, concerns, views? Okay. Yeah. No. Maybe, maybe not a question, but just to add on what you say. Not English from IBM. Um, Thank you very much also for your comforting words about open source and that it should be fine. Uh, I also have the impression the message that we said got heard and the open source topic, and I like to stress this, this is not a topic of individual lobbying or whatsoever or, or things. It's a topic of 
significant substance of the innovation ecosystem for Europe. Um, clearly, the Commission had good intentions when they crafted Recycle 10, but it went wrong. Right? And uh, it's very important to fix this to make clear that uh, I mean, open source source code must always be available, otherwise it's not open source. Right? That's critical. Um, individual developers who contribute cannot be made liable because otherwise people don't send anybody to contribute anymore. Right? If there is a risk that you send someone and they have right away liability, it doesn't work. Uh, the open source innovation power will stop in Europe. And thirdly, also, uh, all those hosting the source code, Eclipse Foundation, Linux Foundation, GitHub, they cannot be considered manufacturers or, or, or distributors because they are not, and they are not meant to be, right? And even if something is, is coined, the Eclipse data space connector, it, it has the Eclipse name there, but Eclipse only provides the framework for doing the open source development, the governance framework. They are not a manufacturer or distributor. It must be those who really take the code put it into a commercial activity, make money with it, who are. And they are ready, I can say for IBM, they are ready to take the viability. But up to this step, when something is brought into a commercial activity, it must be exempted from, uh, from the use. From the so thank you very much for driving this in the council as well. And it's yeah. very happy, happy to see that uh, all the messages that, that we got into our negotiation, into our rationals, uh, are the same ones that we are presenting today. So. So happy, it's ha happy to know that we didn't miss anything. Thanks, Jochen. James? Yes, yeah, so James, mm -hmm. Renner, just to echo uh, Jochen's uh, uh, point about how welcome it is to hear that uh, reassurance. I guess my question about the commerciality, that was his third point, um, and the reference to possible guidance, which is going to be potentially in the final regulation, to better understand how the new legislative frameworks, uh, terms, conditions, notions, definitions fit with software, uh, in particular, open source. So, it, could you shed some light on that? Is there a discussion now within council to see how that's going to that guidance could potentially post adoption further help iron out some of the, the question marks that we have around what is commercial, what's not commercial, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think that would help a lot. Thank you. That's a tough question because that's uh, one of the, the definitions that generates more debate. What is commercial? I, I cannot say much. Uh, I, I cannot say much about the exact text because it's being negotiated still. But I mean, the, the final wording is not agreed in the concept. But uh, if I would have uh, been forced to choose a magic word, I would say profit. Okay. Very good. I think this set up the uh, panel uh, quite well. Jose Carlos, thank you so much for joining. Especially, you know, busy days. I'm going to pick up the, yeah. the, the microphone. As you can tell, we don't have too many microphones. <laughs> so you'll have to share one. It's up there. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Yeah, okay, perfect. So, um, the, the style I usually use when I interview is, or like, like moderate the panel is a bit informal, so I'm not going to go for a long formal introduction, even though you both deserve one, but I'll leave it to you to introduce yourselves. Um, um, so I'll ask a question and then, yeah, get into an in, in, introduce who you are and what you do and why, why uh, you think we've invited you to talk here today. Um, but I think um, one thing that we really want to underscore, and I think uh, uh, it's just to, of course, talk about the implications of the CRA or potential implications of the CRA on, on free and open source software. But we would like, I would like to start by making the link between free and open source software to the European uh, economy and society. So the EU IT, and IT industry, but also broader than that, like what open source software is in the economy and let's say innovation ecosystem today. Um, and that left, I'd like to start with you. Um, in your job at ETAS Bosch, how do you perceive the impact uh, of the CRA um, on the practices of your company, large-scale industrial uh, software development and engagement? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, first of all, for the invitation. Uh, also, to give you a little bit of background, uh, I'm with the Bosch Group since uh, more about you know, 25 years, always in the software area. I'm coming from the computer science. And uh, so uh, we are in, of course, automotive industry, but also in, I would say, home appliance, so uh, other topics, gardening tools, power tools, and so on. And everywhere, open source is in. 
And so for us, it's clear that we have the full liability for our products, independent what's in. If it's a screw from a manufacturer and we are using it for safety critical applications, we are liable for this. The same if there is open source in, we are liable. Therefore, it's not a question or we don't expect that we get an ex um, exemption for us using open source. We are taking the liability for this built-in software. And therefore, we got also a bit scared when we heard about the first draft of the CRA and uh, we rose our, our head and, and, and explained also to the European Commission that we have a big, big issue here if it's going in the wrong direction. Because if we are not allowed to use the open source, because um, perhaps because the open source community would say, you can use it everywhere, but not in Europe because of the CRA, if this is uh, the, the argumentation, the entire industry, not only automotive, is in a deep, 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 deep problem. We cannot develop these things by our own. And therefore, that we are not lobbying for us. We are lobbying for using high quality open source to be used in our products. And in our context, we have a special, in the automotive area, we have a very special um, challenge compared to the most, compared to most of the other industries. Our product life cycles are about 20 years. In the commodity products, like we are just looking into mobile, camera. They have a three, four years. But we need to maintain this software, which is included over 20 years. The vehicles are running on the road average in Germany about 40.7 years, but they are even running much, much longer in the European Union. And this means we need to maintain this software over a long, long period of time. And this can only be done with open source approaches. And there you see the impact. If we are not allowed to use the open source, then we are done. And so we got really scared when we read the uh, information, for example, by the Python Foundation. Huh, if the CRA is coming like this, we might need to think about not allowing Python to be used in Europe anymore. But this would be a nightmare for us because all our tooling environment, all our software scripts and, and so on, they are all used or um, yeah, they are using Python. And this is the impact. So now you understand that we are quite scared. <laughs> but uh, now we don't have anyone from Python here, but we have somebody from Apache. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Dean, um, as founder of the Apache Software Foundation, can you talk about just, again, the possible implications from your point of view of the CRA on the FOSS ecosystem, just this open sharing and collaboration? Maybe could you understand why is there a worry in the ecosystem? Well, yeah, uh, thanks for, thank for the question. And introduce yourself as yeah, well. Yeah, I'll, I'll introduce myself. So, uh, Dirk van der um, I'm one of the, the founders of the, uh, the Apache Software Foundation. Uh, once upon a time, I was still a respectable sort of physicist and uh, worked with the European Commission, and then basically I was ordered to work on this, this thing, which later was supposed to be called the Internet and, and the World Wide Web. Um, and that led to Apache, that led ultimately sort of like to the Apache Software Foundation, which is sort of like now one of the, the larger, you know, the open source organizations in the world. Um, and basically what we do there is, is um, we have lots of professionals, lots of um, uh, people who work full time for companies all over the world, in Europe, wherever they are, um, working on, on software, on open source software. If you take a typical European SME or even if you take someone like Boss, uh, um, 80-90% of their software stack will be open source. Uh, and, uh, and if you look at, at SaaS services, it will, that, that number will be much, much, much higher. So obviously, when you talk about CRA, CRA is, is, is not just regulating some proprietary bits of software uh, at the top. It basically is 80-90% of its impact is all open source. Uh, since that's our core business, I mean, we, we, we worry about that. And if you look very closely at how open source comes to be, um, the distinction between when it's commercial and open source isn't really easy to make, which is logical because like 80-90% of, of every commercial software stack is open source. We have uh, thousands, many tens of thousands of developers who are full-time employed by companies here in Europe and the rest of the world who work for a very large part of their time on open source. 
not necessarily because they want to make open source better, but because they want to, their, their employers, their, their setting, want certain things in that software to be better, more fit for Europe, more fit for whatever they're doing in automotive or, or some other arcane sort of like business. Um, so, and they happen to have found out, the industry as a whole has happened to have found out that over the years that contributing back some of the things you're doing for your customer, um, yeah, basically to your, to your competitors, to your peers, simply makes business sense. It sort of like makes your maintenance easier. It's together you sort of like can, can build something a little bit better uh, and, and, and serve your customers better. At the same time, those companies who place that product on the market, who sell that service, who sell that product, they're usually extremely proud of their software and they, they stand behind it just like, like, like Bosch is not an exception. Every one sort of like those companies we, like, like with basically Apache volunteers work for, they're very fiercely proud of their software and they absolutely stand behind the entire stack they're delivering. Even though 89% isn't written by them when they sell it to their customers or when they, give, they provide service to their customers, they feel responsible, they are responsible for that whole thing and they'll, they'll keep that up and running and alive. Now, what happens with a CRA, or what happens in general, is what happens when, in that very commercial setting, at that call phase, you're making an improvement, or you're making a security fix. Um, of course, you're going to provide to your customers, right, because that's your, your first priority. But you probably will also supply it back to the Apache Software Foundation, so that basically the, the, the software basis you're built upon can become safer for everyone. Um, that's a bit of a win-win for you, it's, there's a certain amount of altruism in that, but it's also because long-term you also benefit from a safer ecosystem. Now, that, that fix was de developed in a very, very commercial setting. That now goes back to Apache, and then from Apache it goes back to sort of like all your competitors, to your peers and everyone else. That fix was, was written by someone full-time employed at your company. Um, you're not going to tolerate any sort of like risk or liability associated with you giving, doing your sort of like fixing it back, basically giving it back to the community, because your customers are not paying for that. You have no idea how that fix is going to be used by others. So there is sort of like a lot of sort of like fear, uncertainty and doubt in that process. So one of the things about open source is, and one of the, the, the secrets of open source, and it's a bit of a dirty secret, is that that win-win is very, very fragile. Um, it's, it's always, it's usually much easier to simply hoard all your changes. The fact that we sort of like contributed back is because there is a, we've learned long term, there is a win-win. But 99 out of 100 companies never ever contribute anything back, even though they may have very valuable things. So it's a very fragile process. So the primary worry in the Apache Software Foundation is, is volunteers, and with that all those, 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 those SMEs and companies around the world and Europe, is that we're breaking that very fragile win-win situation that we basically see companies at the edge still making security fixes, but not contributing them back. And that's a concern, because while in the Apache Software Foundation we typically fix things fast within hours and days, the industry as a whole isn't so good. I mean, in many ways the CRA is something this industry badly needs to, to get security better. Um, but, but meddle with that, yeah, basically with that, with that, uh, that process by having a, yeah, a, a, a not perfect abstraction, a not perfect definition of what open source, really where open source starts and where commercial begins, yeah, really sort of like is risky. And it's a hard problem, right? Because again, so like 89% of any software stack in Europe at an SME or the company is open source. So that's basically sort of like where our, our yeah, real, real concern is. Okay, perfect. And um, now this is a bit of a tricky question because there's essentially one big study of the economic impact of open source that's been made in Europe and uh, it was published by the Commission in 2019 and we were involved in writing this. Uh, but in the process of writing this we also learned of how understudied this area is of economic impact. So instead of just regurgitating like the numbers that we, uh, the, 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 we and the research team came up with, it, I'll give you a little bit of freedom of just like reflecting over the kind of societal impact of let's say um, a cooling effect on open source without, you know, not here to be like overly dramatic and kind of doomsday, but just everything from, from washing machines to, to, to cars, power tools, but, you know, Apache is right there in the middle. How big is it and how important is it? Right. So, so I, I think, um, I mean, I mean, obviously, sort of like we could sort of like all, all, all sort of like look at the, the, the sort of like trillions of dollars uh, or euros basically associated with this, and, and, and simply given the fact that sort of like 89% or it was a SaaS service uh, in the high 90s uh, percent of, of the software stack 
that particular thing runs on is, is open source. It's basically it's essentially the value of the IT industry uh, that is sort of like really scaled down to 90% is, is, is the value of that open source thing. Um, but I think um, what that's sort of like in a way doing a little bit of disservice to, to what open source is, right? Because um, to some extent, open source, the reason why companies are collaborating around open source or why they sort of like find a win-win um, is because we have a lot of things in society that we somehow need to do together, where we need to exchange data, uh, where we need to uh, um, uh, make systems talk to each other. Um, and as things get more complex, what we're finding is that it's, it's often easier to simply use the same piece of software when we want to talk to each other or, or basically sort of like have a lot of commonality uh, in, in, yeah, in basically the things where we don't do anything special. Like if we take sort of like Porsche as an example again, basically they'll use sort of like metric screws, uh, uh, basically number three or number five uh, uh, all over the place, just like every other company does in Europe who needs, needs screws and bolts and nuts and things like that and washers. So in a way, basically open source is, is really that, right? I mean, if you would go to a builder's market to sort of like buy stuff from your house, everyone recognizes the boot and, and, and the stuff like that. If you, if you buy a tire, you know it's a tire, right? And there's nothing special about it. In a way, that's what open source is. It's all basically sort of like, it's, it's the entire foundations of the IT industry. Um, and the very point is that it's, it's, it's yeah, basically the same basis uh, because we want all these things to work together and, and, and be logical and, and, and so on. So I would basically say like, like the economic impact is simply basically how we is it use IT to, to run in many society, especially the bits where we all need to be the same because we want to uh, trade with each other or, or, or supply information and so on. Yeah, well, perhaps to add a little bit on, on what you just told, I would bring another analogy. Uh, in Europe, we have a power supply of 220 volt or 230 volt. It's open to everybody. If somebody would now tell, okay, we let's go to 165 volt, then we have a severe problem because the infra, uh, complete infrastructure will break. And uh, the same would happen with open source. If uh, open source will be um, pulled out of the industry, we, the infrastructure is completely down. This is one social impact. And the other, I would say more looking into the for, uh, forward direction, we urgently need software specialists in the European Union for our industries. And we have a pure fight for talents, not only within Europe, but across the world. It's a big mega shift of uh, IT competences around the world. So if we would have, uh, if we would like to have a really secure labor market for IT technologies, <clears throat> we need to be in this area of open source active because this is one very important advertisement uh, criteria also for computer scientists. If I'm, a, and I'm a computer scientist, I want to work in a computer scientist environment. And open source is one of the critical resource of this computer scientist environment. So if we are restricting this, the usage, we will restrict our economy to develop towards software development. This is a very severe impact on our society and our economy. Yeah, and I'm thinking here, uh, thanks for this. And I'm um, obviously maybe a talking point, sounds like a good tweet. The CRA is about open source first. I think that is at least a, a good starting point to think about these questions because, of course, the goals are also shared by the open source community to just make software more secure. But just in terms of understanding impact, I think, you know, ele what we hope to do with an event like this also is just to elevate this part of the conversation because there are no spokespeople for open source. It's a very different ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But I think I, I want to get to those questions about maybe a bit more hopeful end of building building some bridges and things. But um, I'd like uh, I'd like you to uh, really dig into some 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 details here of of. Uh, um, the, the specific challenges that uh, the CRA potentially could could pose to the FOSS community. And I should say here that, of course, we're referring back a, uh, quite a lot to like earlier iterations of the text. So not specifically on the language right now. But we'll have other sessions to discuss that. But um, let, if you start, just help us connect the dots because it can get quite abstract sometimes if you're not right there in software development. 
from what you see in the CRA and the risks that you have raised to let's say a developer at Bosch? Could you connect those dots and like how that would affect the day-to-day -day work uh, just kind of in practice? Yeah, uh, so I can give uh, concrete examples. So uh, in the automotive industry, we have a tremendous, a tremendous shift also in a kind of transformation towards a software-driven industry. This is um, happening uh, while uh, we are getting more and more high-performance computer inside the vehicles and we are getting also software features connected uh, with uh, services in the cloud. Therefore, we have a dramatic shift, and so we uh, we are uh, um, using now more and more software, which is coming from the open source area. Earlier, in the deeply embedded area, this was not the case. There is, to be honest, n no software at all for an ESP and so on. But now, with the vehicle computers, where we are uh, having features uh, which are with uh, like autonomous driving, where you have a feature which is. Uh, um, as, um, not in one single uh, computer box anymore, but spread across the entire vehicle or even across fleets, across the cloud, there you need to use this uh, different type of software, which is based on open source software. And now the people are also looking, the developers are looking which kind of software can be introduced into my products, dependent on the functional safety level, which I need to address. In a functional, highly functional safety relevant <laughs> features, you will hardly not use this. But in other, we call it quality managed software, there it's heavily used. For example, in the entire infotainment area, it's in. And then you use the software and you need to monitor is there any vulnerability that you can fix it in a fast manner and deploy it also in a fast manner via the OEMs into the vehicles. And therefore, you need to have this connectivity, strong connectivity to the open source communities. And if you see a bug, as you mentioned, you fix it and you bring it back to the, to, to the open source community. So we are doing this, but of course, it's a learning process. I would say the industry, especially the automotive industry, is in a learning phase there. But from the Bosch side, we are doing this already heavily. Uh, but without this, we cannot deliver all the, our products anymore. So, the, of course, we are looking also that we are not using software in an illegal manner. So, all our products are tracked and scanned for open source licenses. We have to fulfill uh, specific uh, requirements coming from our customer that we provide all the licenses. Uh, we check whether the licenses are compatible to each other so that we are not building up wrong products. So we have a lot of competence in using open source in a legal manner. And there are really technical details. No? So sometimes you, if you link libraries in a static manner, this can hit you badly because then you might have an illegal product where you can use a library also as a dynamical link, then it, it's legal. But you need this experience. And therefore, we are investing year on year millions for scanning all our products and also contributing back. And these are yeah. real developer tasks. Yeah. And I, I think here, uh, because when discussing these things and talking about the implications, um, uh, I always find there's a bit of, there's kind of an elephant in the room in terms of these discussions. So uh, they feel, what are we actually talking about when we're talking about um, a false exemption? You know, it's 80 to 90% of all software, even more in some others. That sounds like we would create a massive loophole if we're just unregulated software. What is actually being called for here? Right, right. So, so first of all, I, th I think so like, um, the word exemption sort of like is, it makes me a bit uncomfortable because really, uh, I mean, you shouldn't have 80, 90% or in a, if it's a SaaS start, 99% of your stack being exempt from a regulation we, we badly need, right? I mean, the security industry has made a bit of a dog breakfast of, 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 of the IT industry, a bit of a dog breakfast of security. So we, we do sort of like need that security to go, basically become better across the board, absolutely everywhere. So we really shouldn't be looking at, at exempting open source in, 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 in that fashion. Now, if you go back to those open source developers, so, so, so that just just paint the story from the developer at the call phase who actually delivers to customer and, and knows that's going to be used in a car and, and stands behind that car and then puts a nice brand in it or something. Where sort of like open source developers are more sort of like on the um, on the one hand sort of like they work in a company and they know exactly 
for what customer they're doing it for and how it's going to be used. But from the open source side purely, um, you're much more like a nut and a bolt manufacturer. Um, and and that, that, that nut you just made, it may be used for a picture, it may be used for a bike, or it may be used for something which really doesn't matter, like some IKEA furniture without collapses, or maybe something highly critical in a car or whatever else. But you don't really know as a, as a developer. I mean, you may be making a vert maybe like, like a fertilizer you're selling, fertilizer may be used for, for, for crop or right, for explosive or whatever else. So, there's a lot you sort of like don't know as an open source developer uh, as you sort of like work on that. On the other hand, just like with that nut or that bolt, there are a lot of quality control systems and bits of governance and things you can do to basically make sure that what goes out of that open source into the industry to be used in whatever else being used, that that is good. So if you take Apache, for example, we, we've got very stringent rules that uh, no releases go out uh, with, with known security issues, um, uh, fixes are always mentioned in the release notes, uh, things have to be fixed timely, um, and, 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 and uh, so on and so on, and we do responsible disclosure. And also sort of like we then have sort of the processes on top of that to make sure that, that when these things are not happening in our open source community, because in the end of the day, everyone, I mean, they're all, all the volunteers, um, that this sort of like does sort of like get escalated, that we do stop distributing that software, or that in the worst case, that software gets moved into what we call the ethics or the ethics in that software, and then sort of like cease to exist, or we pull a release or whatever else. Um, and likewise, you also try to sort of like have a whole bunch of things whenever you're pushing out a release, you go through to make sure that that release is is tip top. So you not, not only do you <coughs> have I fixed all the security holes on you, but also um, um, are the release notes there? Is the license there? Are the dependency there? Um, am I referencing something which actually has a known issue? Uh, um, have I sort of like ran basically sort of like all the basics, uh, hygiene things uh, on that package which you need? Um, I'm a little bit vague here because in Apache basically uh, we have everything from, from uh, a graphics library to something which runs an initial PLC to whatever else. So it, it, each community is different in, in what their industry largely needs uh, in, in terms of, of, of that sort of like uh, uh, compliance. And we generally sort of like as an organization wrap that up uh, in what we call a release vote. So no product goes out without a few of the core developers explicitly personally having said like yes we've sort of like done it this release is ready it meets all the requirements and if one of them vetoes it the release won't go out and that's sort of like then paired sort of like with a coupling back to the board where sort of like all the project reports uh, uh, several times a year or if the project is in dire straits they, they report every month uh, back on the sort of like compliance aspect to make sure that what goes out is essentially uh, clean but it's a little like the joke that Titanic, right? They may make an sort of so like when the Titanic left here, when left the work, it was uh, she was fine. I mean, um, we don't know how that software ultimately gets used in the field, uh, and, and so that's why it's so important that rather than focus on exceptions for open source, we make sure that open source attaches at the place where, where oh, sorry, that, that the CRA attaches at the place where it really matters. That's basically near that call phase where the product goes to the customer, and you know exactly what it's doing what it's supposed to do, how to support it, what requirements it needs to meet, to meet, and that you're very careful about anything going the opposite direction. So when a company makes a fix, a security fix for their customers and also upstreams it so it goes to everyone else. Because if you impair that process, we're making the world less secure rather than, than more secure. And of course, there's also a competitive angle to that. And they feel like just one quick thing, because I often realize that this is something that should be discouraged. You can describe it as well. What is upstream and what is downstream? I think this is like one of those things that oh, like okay. software people should sometimes take a step out and just explain this dynamic. Right. Yes. Yeah, so, so sorry. That was a, that I should have defined that term. So basically, whenever you uh, uh, write a piece of software, let's say that a piece of software, that Apache Software Foundation exists, and it goes to let's say, uh, um, well, we have someone's IBM in the room. It basically sort of like it's the Apache web server and it goes to IBM and or it goes to Oracle and they sort of like make a nice package out of it. That's what we basically call a downstream. Now then, for example, the IBM package may be bought by some, some finance company to make some nice finance package. That's sort of like, again, sort of like a downstream. So as you get close to the consumer, you're sort of like going downstream. Fixes, improvements, and things like that go upstream. So basically, whenever sort of like uh, someone in the field finds a security hole and makes a fix or reports it, um, it basically that sort of like patch then goes upstream to, for example, the Apache Software Foundation, and sometimes from us it will go up, upstream even further, let's say, to the Linux Foundation or some other package. Um, and then when the sort of like the industry as a whole has made a fix, that fix then sort of like goes downstream again. 
And it's a fairly messy process because it's quite common for, for example, a fix to be made somewhere downstream to go upstream. That fix is then improved. It, it's found that actually that security hole actually exists in more places, so the fix gets bigger. Uh, so what you actually see is that as, as a company, if you initially sort of like contribute a small fix to the open source world, you find back that sort of like three months later, you see a whole bunch of changes coming back to you, uh, which actually fix a much broader problem than the one you found. That's also basically where you win-win is why you actually sort of like upstream that in the first place. But that sort of like is a fairly sort of like it's sort of like essentially sort of like a wave going backwards and forwards, uh, and so downstream towards the customer, upstream basically towards the, the, the source of the of, of where the software came from. And okay, can yeah, okay. Yeah, please, please. Uh, um, uh, explaining also from our uh, yeah, industry yeah, perspective, in even uh, within our industry, uh, we take care uh, uh, that uh, developers are allowed to contribute to dedicated software open source projects. There is a process running inside our company to uh, uh, wave for people to contribute to dedicated software uh, open source projects not everybody can contribute to any uh, to all software projects it's a controlled and managed process and if you look if, if in our product is for example a software stack version 1.0 in and we identify a defect we could uh, uh, fix the defect in our own environment would work, but if there is a, a version 2.0 of this stack, we would need to build in our fix again in this version. And uh, typically there is not only one bug, there might be 10, 20 bugs. Managing these fixes locally or within the own versions is not suitable anymore because it's, it's not manageable. Therefore, contributing back the, uh, uh, the fixes in the upstream will ensure that we get with the next downstream our fix automatically within the open source project integrated. And this is uh, the big, big benefit because otherwise the quality would even drop, would drop. But I have another point uh, which I would like to mention. We were always talking about the software stacks. That's only one half of the story. The entire open source industry influences heavily the de software development processes and the methodologies used in the software engineering area. If you look all these DevOps approaches, they are coming more or less from the open source. So if you look the first uh, configuration management systems, the RCS or what it's yeah. called, it was all open source. So these processes were coming from that community and got improved over the uh, time. Of course, company built then on top their products. Uh, I remember earlier the MKS system. They were purely based on this standard configuration management system from the open source. So the tooling aspect in the open source, and therefore, for example, the uh, Eclipse Foundation is so important for us, the tooling aspect and the process impact for the development in the industry is tremendously important. So, I mean, uh, DevOps, tooling, etc. cetera, um, let's perhaps stay, uh, stay there a little bit because yeah. I think there's an interesting question about like, David, you talked about like the need for, you know, more investment into security, generally speaking, in maybe not just the IT industry, but the industry in general. Um, um, but if we, we stick with, with the open source ecosystem, this broad term that means so many different things, but what is being done right now uh, in order to in, improve security? I mean, it is, if I talk to an open source uh, expert professional developer, security is an obsession. It's the only thing being talked about. So what is actually being done? Yeah, yeah. so uh, if you have open source, everybody can look into the source and everybody can check whether there's a vulnerability. If I get only the binary, the effort to check for vulnerabilities would be even much, much higher. So uh, I, I call, always call binaries and uh, saying uh, I'm delivering binaries only because it's more secure. Then I would say, okay, this sounds to me like security by obscurity. If I open up the source and everybody can look in, then I see, is it really secure? Oh, mm -hmm. This is one aspect. Yeah. That's a question. Ah, you I know what? Know. Let's get a question. Is it time for questions already? Uh, my, as I said, my tech is being used for other things. I think there. What time is it actually? It's 15 minutes. 15 minutes. So as in, yeah, yeah. 45. Let's obviously get a question in. Yeah, yeah we're going on. It was about that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So I'm Torvald Terekalio, the Estonian cyber attaché. Uh, this is my first exchange with the open source community uh, regarding the CRA. It's very educative. Um, for Estonia, uh, the open source question in the CRA is uh, one of the key priorities. I would even say the first one uh, to get right, because as you might know, the digital society of Estonia also depends on open source solutions. Um, I wish we would spend still more time in the council talking about that issue. I think Jose Hello said that it's enough, but uh, in my opinion, uh, like listening to all, all of that, uh, there are new elements that come in. Uh, so I have two questions. One is about uh, monetization and the profit part. I wanted to just understand a bit better how uh, these uh, open source organizations work, which part of their um, activity can be monetized, for example, you know, technical support or uh, is there anything that is monetized? How do the people who contribute uh, burn their income? Or And then the second one relates to what you just said. Um, so it's um, like the element about the vulnerability reporting. Is there any kind of interaction between the open source community and the CSERTs or the authorities. Now, uh, do they regularly do the voluntary reporting, for example, whether the, in case all the open source uh, area would be excluded from the scope of the CRA, uh, would there be in the future uh, this kind of voluntary reporting? How, how would other um, users of the open source understand when there is some vulnerability in their element. Is there a need for the CSER to be the CVD kind of coordinator in that case? Uh, I yeah. hope I was clear enough. Yeah, that. just to, to, to start on the on the on the business model side. Um, th there are many open source organizations and they're all and they're all uh, there are all sorts of variations. Um, the Marshall organization is is, is is basically one of the oldest and largest one and, and uh, it's it's very very simple in that case. Basically, we're a non-volunteer organization. So our developers are uh, uh, paid by their employees, uh, or their, by their employers, or perhaps they, they may, be, uh, may, may come with a pension or are very rich or something, but that's actually very rare. Uh, nine out of 10 or nine out of 100 of our developers are, are, are basically full-time paid by their companies to work on software. And a large part of that happens to be open source software. So in Apache, basically, the only people we pay uh, uh, out, of, out, out of donations is really on the side of the organization, like our lawyers, our accountants, uh, um, and, and we also, for example, pay one person uh, so that we have a, a, a very rapid 24-7 sort of like a security response uh, on the initial emails coming in. But uh, there's basically no, no business model whatsoever around it. It's basically much more like a, 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 professional, uh, a, a, a professional organization, basically, of, of, of engineers or something like that, where essentially it's all volunteers working on, on their specific topic. And uh, uh, yeah, there's no, no, no money changes hand, the, the no money is being made, there's no business model. Um, if you want to have support on a your product, that's perfectly fine. There are many, many companies which, which supply this, uh, uh, but that's entirely outside the Apache Software Foundation. We just supply the software for free. Uh, we don't pay for it, no one pays for it. Um, yeah, basically, we're, there's no commercial things entering into that. Uh, all the donations we do get from companies are, are basically spent on lawyers first and then on, on some other small things, administrative things, uh, things next. Um, as to your sort of like, uh, uh, David, sorry, jumping in there. One thing that it's great that you explained Apache, but could you maybe just describe a little bit the diversity of the yeah. many different yeah, that's a good idea. So basically, Apache is, is, is sort of like the simplest one and one of the oldest ones. Uh, the second model you sometimes see in the industry is, is a little bit sort of like of the, 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 the pay to play model, where um, you pretty much still got the same model as Apache, where everyone is a volunteer, etc. But um, uh, uh, a, a bunch of companies basically uh, pay uh, a certain amount. They do a, they do a contribution. They do a, a donation, um, and in return for that, they get board seats. And board seats, of course, means you've got a certain amount of control over those foundations. In Apache, that's absolutely not the case. We, we basically uh, the board never ever interferes with 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 any with what people are doing. The only time the board pulls the plug is when there's for example a security issue. But they will never tell anyone what to code. Of course, when you're in the pay to play foundations, it gets a little bit different. Once you're sort of like beyond that point, it sort of like gets quite complex, uh, um, and you start to get all sorts of models uh, 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 where, for example, um, uh, groups of people come together or small groups of companies come together, for example, and uh, um, 
they do sort of like collectively pay a few developers to work on open source, so then, then all of a sudden it looks a lot more commercial. Or you have situations where basically uh, they come together and they, they, they sell support, and with that support they then sort of like pay themselves. But you sort of like then, then quite quickly go into, even though the, the source code may be open and meet the open source definition, you very sort of like then sort of gently sort of like slip into a, into a commercial model. Um, until you sort of like are, are all the way to extreme uh, uh, spectrum and, and, and not, not to pick on anyone, but for example, like Reddit is a perfect example. They're a completely commercial company and they support uh, uh, yeah, lots of open source projects. So, so they're not really an open source foundation or anything like that at all, but, but their company is entirely about open source. So that's kind of like the, the, yeah, at, at the far extreme of that. But, but basically sort of like, uh, yeah, that, that whole range is, 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 is available. And then maybe just add, there's package yeah. managers, there's uh, code repositories. Yeah. That yeah. It is very large yeah. and a one size fits all, I think. But you know, I'm not the moderator. Yeah. Then, like, yeah. You, yeah, so if you look, for example, to the Eclipse Foundation, this is a completely yeah. different approach than uh, Apache. Uh, Eclipse Foundation, for example, Bosch and Eaters are members of this, uh, but we are not owning it and we are not financially benefiting from it, we are supporting these uh, foundations because we are convinced that they are doing the right thing. So for example, they are um, uh, um, in, uh, I think this year in, in June uh, or July, there will be an uh, Eclipse Foundation Day at, uh, close to Munich, am Spadenkirchen. So this event needs to be somehow paid because it, there is cost involved. They are using our membership fees, it's like a club. Uh, uh, to to pay the cost for this. So, but it's not a financial. Im, uh, um, um, that, that you can call it like an NGO, no? Yeah. So, and and or, this, or like a, like an organization yeah. of, of engineers, like yeah. or, or medical professionals. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're much more like professional organizations. But you asked another question with regard to vulnerabilities. Again, you can even set up an open source project without being in such a foundation. I can set up an open source project and put my code somewhere. If a lot of people are jumping in, this could become a success or uh, if nobody is jumping in, it might fail very fast. We as a company, we will never ever go for this, I would say, tiny project because you cannot be sure that you can maintain or that this project will be maintained over time and that they will provide us a proper uh, tracking of, of vulnerabilities. So our open source projects which we are using are fully under the vulnerability checks and so if there is a vulnerability it will immediately uh, be reported into, into our product uh, development uh, life cycle and to be honest the open source projects are typically faster. So this is a benefit. Using the open source project for uh, this kind of things, they can react much, much, much faster. And this is beneficial for us, for the security of our products as well. Going a bit off I'll add a few. Yeah. So, 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 so in, in general, so like if you go to the more established open source foundations who uh, have an awful long levity and, 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 and yeah, reliability that that industry will build upon them, whether you're a small SMB or when you're a large company. I mean, pretty much all of them basically uh, uh, take in uh, security reports and usually sort of like uh, are, are quite good at, at funneling and triaging that quickly. Uh, so in the budget we get these things coming in. At our scale, that basically means that sort of like one or two a day are actually serious and, and need to be need to be addressed. Um, in all the funds, this then sort of like goes to the uh, typically confidentially uh, uh, to the uh, to the developers of that particular code base to further triage, uh, uh, figure out a bug, uh, figure out a fix, or work with the with the submitter uh, in private to basically uh, get it resolved. In the meantime, you always ask for a CVE number, and you start using that CVE number to basically make sure that everyone sort of like has the same tracking of that. Then, sort of like depending on the situation. Uh, um, yeah, basically, uh, uh, and, and what it is, you then sort of like go through the process of, of, of making a release. Um, if the issue is very particularly sensitive, um, the release and the fix you're doing will will be kept out of public view. So it will be actually, or, or you, you, you obfuscate how you describe it so it isn't clear to the community that, that what is what's being fixed um, until it's ready, basically, and can go to everyone. And then you sort of like uh, uh, publish uh, uh, the CVE number along with the description and, and mitigation and measurements, things like that. Um, in some cases, you decide that actually 
the fix is going to be complex, but there's an easy mitigation. Uh, in, in those cases, you'll, of course, report that earlier and send and basically do that outreach much earlier. And in all of those cases, the C-certs and the certs and so on, they're, they're basically sort of like being informed and you sort of like, well, you don't read the reports, but you basically sort of like basically send out email messages to them, like you know, basically with, with your reports, with your vulnerability scans and things like that. Um, that process isn't always uh, perfect, and one of the things we see as Apache is that, that some of the C uh, certs basically complain to us that, that we're sending too many of them, <laughs> that, it, that, it's, that the volume is too high. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, so basically that is a, is a fairly structured process, and regardless of the CRA and whether it comes to pass or not, I mean, that's, that process will be followed, and, and, and that's pretty much what the CRA ex expects us to do. Uh, the one niggle in the CRA is, and that's something we absolutely do not know, is that it, in its current writing um, expects uh, unfixed vulnerabilities to be reported uh, centrally, uh, and that's something we, we completely abhor because we're incredibly worried about having a central stash of, of exploits that aren't yet fixed. So even in our own organization, a lot of things are on a need-to-know basis, and, and we carefully keep them uh, yeah, sort of like close to our chest until they have really been fixed. Because we also know that that Apache is of course international, and um, yeah, I mean these, these 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 vulnerabilities have all sorts of values. So you don't want to get into a situation where you have to report them in one country and, and you're not allowed to, dis to disclose them in another country and things like that. So we easily stay completely out of that. Uh, uh, one additional hint, more downstream mm -hmm. to the product, if the patch for the bug is available, it does not uh, didn't uh, reach at that time. The final product. Mm -hmm. This is a much much bigger challenge for the industry. For example, if you are looking into the into the uh, automotive area, millions of vehicles are running on the road. You need to get this patch deployed into the vehicles, or in the washing machines, or whatsoever. And these are not centrally coordinated devices anymore. So in that sense, open source gives us the opportunity to address this topic. But the open source can never ever fix the products in the field. So therefore the liability for this cannot be with the open source products because they even do not have access to the products in the field or the components in the field. Because if I would have the liability, I'm in charge to address the issue in the field. This, I think it's important to understand. Yeah. And, and there's also uh, something else happening in here which really helps security in open source is that those open source developers, it's much like when you're developing a bolt. I mean, when you're making a bolt, there are only a few things you can really focus upon, like uh, its strength and things like that. So that means that open source developers are typically very fanatical about getting their product absolutely right, absolutely secure, and, and basically as well as they can. And they can afford to do that because that's really sort of like their only focus. Whereas if you're that washing machine manufacturer or you're that car manufacturer, there are a lot of other concerns, basically, and trade-offs to be made. Because for Apache, for us, it's easy. Hey, we've got a bug, we fix it, and we, we do a new release. What's the problem? Uh, and, 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 and we're proud of that, and, and we enjoy actually doing that. Uh, whereas if you're, yeah, sort of like, uh, uh, yeah, that, that poor car manufacturer, there's yet another bug fix coming, and you've just rolled out the last one. I mean, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it, it, it feels different. So, it's, it's, so in many ways, the open source world has it easy uh, to sort of like do these, these bugs, the security holes, and fix them well, because, yeah, the problems start uh, downstream from us. That's where the, where the rubber hits the road. Uh, say open up for some more questions. Uh, anyone? Yeah, James? Yeah, I had a question for both of you simultaneously. You don't talk about death and secret. Um, and as a Red Hat, uh, we are upstream first company, 100% open source. Uh, half of our engineers are upstream all the time. Uh, so we believe passion in this, in this uh, approach to fixing problems, unlocking the potential. Um, so could the CRA help drive more contribution upstream uh, by, as you say, maturizing, maturizing um, uh, open source? So that's the first one. And then linked to the liability question, we haven't mentioned the product liability directive and the notion of defectiveness and so on. Is there a risk uh, that if strict liability comes in for software, uh, that it inadvertently, uh, which I was talking about inadvertent or unintended consequences, then brings that liability back up? Because there is still this utopian notion in this city about having a bug-free solution. Uh, um, and, and those developers <laughs> upstream do not want to do that. Um, okay, bug-free software is not possible, full stop. 
everybody who's talking something different should go to the university and should go for a real research project uh, and should get a field medal or whatsoever because uh, a formal um, proof of software can be done for some small parts of the software but not for the entire software and especially not for entire systems of software no chance so uh, you, i can uh, talk about this uh, because in the automotive industry we are talking at for uh, in the i would say hardware components in so called ppm rates how many parts per million are getting defect in the field and the target is always a one zero a one digit number so from one million parts maximum nine parts are allowed to fail they have a bug this never ever would work with software so the uh, about 15 years ago we had a big, big discussion inside the automotive industry do we have uh, to use the same ppm rates for software the problem is if you have one bug in a software the ppm rate is immediately 1 million because it's in all components and this is a different to a screw if a screw has a defect it could be re restricted to a, a certain batch of screws and then you can say okay uh, only 1000 cars are impacted by this batch of screws but with the batch of the software all the cars are impacted immediately therefore this is no point of discussion no chance every every person who's addressing this and want to have it in the other direction should go to university and have some courses in computer science. Sorry. I, I have just a small uh, reflection. We talked a bit about it the, uh, before the event, this question of metaphors and how to describe this ecosystem yeah. and the yeah. challenge uh, that comes with that because there are, you know, some metaphors work well in some situations uh, um, and we've come back to the one with about screws here. And it works to explain certain dynamics here, but. I think let's also question that metaphor a little bit because uh, you know, uh, Jose Carlos mentioned the profit streams. The screw designer or maker in this but it's not selling screws. They're not making money from screws. That's where that metaphor fails. That if I'm thinking, reflect a bit about these metaphors and perhaps the challenges of conveying these messages. Yeah. So we, um, um, I already mentioned earlier in, in uh, before this talk, um, we have a severe issue from my perspective also in the computer or software engineer uh, society we are keen to talk about software we are uh, purely in software we have our own language and sometimes we miss to build the verbal bridge to the non-software guys and it's not the point that we are uh, telling we are the best ones but we are we are thinking somehow different and explaining the, uh, this, uh, what we want to convey is a little bit difficult because we are not really looking into the context of the audience who is not coming from the computer science. So building analogies and try to explain the things is so much important, which we somehow miss in the computer science area. The other uh, problem is the non-computer science guys are very often not so keen to get a little bit deeper into the software area and to try to understand the software, the thinking process of the software guys. I'm always giving this example. I mentioned this today in the morning. So most of the people can easily imagine a three-dimensional cube. For me, as a computer scientist, it's not an issue to think about a 27-dimensional cube. For me, it's a very. It could be 30-dimensional. It doesn't matter. For me, it's a data structure in my in my brain but if i want to explain how a 27 dimensional cube is looking like to a person who can think about the three dimensional cube it's very difficult therefore we should not talk about 27 dimensional cubes as a computer science to non computer science because we will simply lose them but this is a way we, where we need to find a common understanding and this is also my perception in the cra discussions that we have not spoken early enough to each other. That's my perception. I don't know whether it's right or wrong, but it's my perception. 
And I have to say, I mean, uh, one way of really simplifying the CRA is that it's extending the the, the legal frameworks of the three-dimensional world into this 27 or 30-dimensional world. And, you know, there's, a, I find in the discussions of, of uh, you know, getting the language right, etc., there's, it's part of it is like, yeah, use more, more, more uh, shapes here, but it's squaring the circle. Like, we're trying to get these things meeting together. I think it will be possible, but we really need to work on it. And I think at this point, what I really would like to stress from, from OFE's side, we're happy to provide this forum, but it's to really sit down and talk this through. Because things are, you know, everyone who's engaged directly with the CRA know that there's some time pressure. Things are moving fast. But if, which of course I would be the first one to sign up to, the CRA is firstly about open source, let's sit down and have these conversations. And I think we'll get there. Jochen, please. Yeah, just to add, um, I'm not sure whether we have not spoken earlier enough, but I, what I sense is that at the level of policymakers, there is still not a, we, we still have a lack of understanding in Europe about open source and its role. There seems still to be a perception Open source is something that some freaks do. They get together in a room and they do something and it's just research and innovation. What is not clear is how much business depends in Europe and how much the innovation cycle for business depends on open source. For them. I, I, tot I totally agree, yeah. but it's on both sides. Okay, absolutely. absolutely. So, and uh, it's not only talking, because talking is uh, very often a one-sided communication. It should be questioning. Ask the people, I do not understand what you just saw. Can you explain it in a different manner? Or did I understand it right? And this should be done in both directions. Not only conveying messages, but asking and uh, really try to understand the other side. And it's not a confronting other side. It's really to understand the the I would say the intention, and then find a common solution on this. And, and I think it, it, it also I think important to stress that it, it, it's not all doom and gloom. Just to go back to, to, to James's questions of like, can it also help improve things? So we know that as an industry we need to improve security. I mean, there's there's no doubt about that. So open source has has first brought sort of like source code to to the, to the industry, and then sort of like as you just alluded to, uh, processes and, and sort of control systems, uh, release processes, build systems, and so on and so on. So if we basically can, um, if this basically we can get the CRA right, then it's very very likely that we'll we'll sort of like see the downstream entities, sort of like the companies who place the product in the market and are responsible for their for for their customers to get much better at reporting problems back upstream. And I think it's also very likely that open source collectively realizes these people sort of like who are making products, they all have the same problem of implementing the CRA or becoming CE compliant and everything else. So why don't we together sort of like already in the open source releases, just like we now package release notes and packaging notes and S-bombs and all these other things, we also add in the bits you need to sort of like comply with the CRA sort of like at, at that call phase. Of course, then it makes, makes it absolutely crucial to sort of like make sure that the liability and the risk and things like that are put in the right places because otherwise, uh, if, if any of that would, would increase the risk for you, then of course you're, the opposite is going to happen, things are going to get less secure. But on the other hand, if you do this right, there is absolutely a chance that that sort of like the next phase of open source will not just be sort of like helping with packages and S bombs and things like that. You should but, mention what S bomb means. Oh yeah, so sorry. With, so basically, sec uh, secure bills of material. So essentially, sort of like labeling really well uh, uh, what is in your software package, what it depends on, because that's typically what just like you need a list of ingredients, or you need to know basically, uh, uh, yeah, basically your group that know where materials came from. Whenever you're assessing something for a security issue or for a reliability issue, you need to know what's in it in the first. And that's what these these S bombs are basically. But that's what these these uh, bills of materials are. But as we sort of like get better at that, it's very easy to, to imagine the open source industry again sort of like going the next step and actually helping people at the call phase, sort of like at that end where they supply with the customer with the the raw materials, if you want, with the templates to actually make their CE certification even if they still certify much 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 easier. Uh, right now, in the in the fabric of the CRA, that's actually risky and and and, and yeah. Harder than it needs to be, but of course, I mean, things can improve. 
And I think uh, Italo, I think it would be great also, I mean, uh, I know Italo, so I think uh, the, the Document Foundation angle in this would be interesting and because I, I, I might pull out some, some people that I see in the audience to get a sense of this, this uh, diversity. Benjamin, you have a question? Yeah, Italo, let's start with you, Benjamin, and then I'm thinking, Peter, talk a bit about software uh, uh, or like uh, package managers, etc. as well. But Italo, let's start, so, let's start with you. Uh, talking from the uh, point of view of uh, a large uh, uh, open source project related to a product like LibreOffice, which is uh, productivity, so it's uh, in front of every user or can be in front of every user. The difference between, uh, so the let's say the mental distance between developers and users, it's incredible. Uh, I'm not a technical person. Uh, I'm, a, let's say, a sophisticated user. But I was not a sophisticated user when I entered into open source. So when I entered, and it was an open office uh, site, I started to say we should document security. It was 17 years ago. And the developers told me, no way. Uh, because uh, security is a given, is a fact. And uh, why we should document it for users? Because I said, because a user like me, and I'm not an, an idiot, uh, if it doesn't see the process documented, it will not believe. And uh, believe me, on the other side, people document things that is not security as security. Uh, one month ago, I had a discussion with a user that told me, we moved our email system to Outlook for security systems. And we said, OK, you are not good for open source. You should never use open source, because if you believe that Outlook, which is the most unsecure software ever written by a human being, uh, then you cannot understand the open source. But this is the average person that we have on the other side. So we, should, we have started to dock now people start to believe me that we should document security. So I've started to write a document that says, this is what we do in terms of security. It cannot be the best solution, but at least it's what we are doing. And uh, documenting it, because we have the numbers. So we have 15 uh, um, Tinder boxes compiling every day LibreOffice. Does anyone know this? No. Users do not understand in the boxes, but if you explain that in a, say, human readable way, they start to understand that we compile every version for every 10 uh, patches, there is a compilation. If it fails, it goes back to the 10 people that have submitted the patches, and if it goes OK, then it goes to the, to the tests. Uh, I think that we should have done a better job in documenting security on our side, not given for granted that as I'm a senior developer, you should trust me, because unfortunately people outside, on the other world, non-technical, by the way, it's 99% of the world population, mm -hmm. uh, do not understand technical stuff. Of course it's difficult. Okay. I, I can immediately uh, contribute to your statement. Security at the end user front is perceived as a burden. If you look, all the users who have access to online shops and so on. Same password. Yeah, same password. And try to convince them not to use it. Uh, it's really tough. But I can even provide an analogy from your home, from your flat. To convince people to exchange the door locks because to be more secured against burglars, most of the people think, OK, I need a really very solid door lock at the front door. The most important door is the back door because burglars are typically coming through the back door and, uh, or through the window. And again, here we have professionals, at least in Germany, you get even support by the government if you get somebody from the police as a kind of consultant to give you advice which parts of your building you should make more secure. And uh, you get financial support for this. And I'm totally with you. We are not doing this sufficiently. Uh, 
who in this room is using encrypted emails on a private level. Hi. But it's very difficult to get somebody on the other side who can receive it. This is the indication that uh, that is what I mentioned with the back door. We, everybody has the back door open. Yeah. Hey, Benjamin? Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, my name is Benjamin. I work for you. Some of you may know me by now. Um, <laughs> just wanted to reassure everyone that as the Commission, we are working really hard to get it right. Uh, it's certainly not in our interest to harm the open source community. But at the same time, we feel that responsibility needs to be placed where it's due, meaning that those that are best placed to fix a vulnerability should also be the ones responsible for fixing it. Just as a general comment, I, I, I wanted to take the floor because I think there are some misconceptions, maybe. So first of all, I keep hearing the word liability, right? So the Cyber Resilience Act is actually not about establishing liability. It's merely about placing responsibility, and that's a completely different issue. So the CRA only assigns responsibility to certain entities to take care of security, but it does not deal with liability. Other legislation may do or does that, right? But the CRA does not. Um, then there was uh, 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 may I ask a question? Uh, for my understanding, it's really a, a question. If I have the responsibility, but if I'm not fulfilling the responsibility, am I not liable? So, not under the Cyber Resilience Act. Yeah? The Cyber Resilience Act will only, like, of course, you can get fined yeah, by a market surveillance authority if uh, you do not comply with the CRA, but the CRA is not like a legal basis for, let's say, a consumer to sue you. Um, uh, for, yeah, but, if, your but if I'm intentionally breaking the responsibility, what is uh, the impact on me if I'm not following the responsibility? This is, this is a question where automatically we in the, in the uh, software community think, okay, if we are not fulfilling the responsibility, we could be punished or should be punished, and this would lead into the direction of perception on our side as liability. Yeah, so I think it's important. I think, I think it's, so I think it's important, and also I think for, for everyone in the discussion, to realize that the open source world and, and um, the copyright systems and everything else around it and everything which governs our systems are, are basically using a lot of American words and, and assumptions. So, so in general, sort of like when, when, we, when we say liability, what we mean is when we don't do that, bad things happen to us. And, and bad things are a problem because it's for something we're not being paid for or not being asked to do. So. I, I, before, because Benjamin, I know you were kind of cut off. Yeah. That, let, 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 finish off with Benjamin and we'll have. Yeah. yeah. We should okay, talk I mean, about this. Of course, that bad things can happen to you <laughs> under the CRA. You don't comply, no, of course. Right? But it's not uh, but rather. Yeah, yeah, but this is a context of the wording again that we are using. Perhaps, have, uh, perhaps we have a different semantics of the word liability. And there it would be good to understand what is meant on both sides. So that we are not talking uh, crisscross. No? Yeah. And then another point: um, the upstream contributions. Now, um, we we fully agree that upstream contributions are extremely important. I think we even support that. That becomes clear from the text that the Commission has proposed. Um, in the original Commission proposal, there is a requirement to report back right to the upstream maintainer of the repository when you identify security issues. Um, since the text leaked, I can I think even go further and say that this was strengthened in the Council. There is like the Council even proposes now or it discusses a possibility of maybe even requiring that you provide uh, the source code of your own bug fix back upstream. Yeah? So we fully support that, and um, under no circumstance would an upstream individual upstream contribution ever be considered a product being placed on the market. So a contribution <coughs> as such would never be under the scope of the Cyber Resilience Act, and using your language, a contributor would never be liable, right? Uh, and, and, uh, and what about the company where the contributor is employed and getting employed by this company? Uh, same, 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 same thing. This I mean, is important. Of course, is responsible for its own product, right? If it yeah. happens to integrate that component into their own products, then they're That's responsible, key. yeah. 
and the maintainer of the repository may also be responsible for the security of the repository if covered by the CRA, but an individual upstream contribution would never be considered as a product placed on the market. Okay, uh, let me ask another question. I uh, provided this example. I, uh, if I would start an open source project on my own, not an uh, like Apache or whatsoever, a big foundation. I it personally was started by somebody at some point. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there were tenants, so, right? <laughs> Work for how, how does then this impact me as a person, as a f founder of a new open source project? Am I automatically reliable or responsible? Uh, responsible, whatever it means. Uh, what kind of obligations do I have to fulfill? And if I'm not sure that I can fulfill this, I will never ever do this because I'm getting scared. Because if I'm even not in a company, it, but I have a great idea, want to bring it to the open source, this could be a barrier to get this innovation. Yeah, but so not every single open source project would be a commercial project, right? So you're not automatically under the scope of the subsidy. Yeah, and this need to be clearly understood by all the people who might not be, I would say, um, uh, so aware with these topics because they are coming from the pure, I would say, really nerdy, uh, nerdic uh, uh, software development, and they are not so much the experts. So uh, at least a corresponding explanation or interpretation, easy to understand for soft where engineers who are totally newbies in the area of l legislation. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I, I think uh, you know, I very much like, like appreciate the clarifications, but I think what I'm also seeing in the in the international in the wider industry that that as big companies and and, and, and obviously big open source foundations of like have lawyers and, and, and experts look at at the, the various drafts and things. <laughs> um, the, the interpretations of like are, are a lot murkier and a lot more more concerned. So I think there is there's still yeah. So like to get sort of like safety like you made sort of like to, to basically like make it much yeah make make sure that basically everyone reads them in, into those documents because right now there is a lot of yeah fear, fear uncertainty and doubt which would influence that 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 behavior around innovation and, and, and taking that away would be a very very valuable thing. Well, right. uh, we, we take the point of course on. Um, reaching out to the community, making everyone understand and having the same interpretation, right? I think as the commission, we're really making a lot of effort. I mean, we're talking to everyone who reaches out to us. We're going to big events, uh, speaking there. We're really doing it. We will also, of course, provide all the verifications necessary at the end of the process in guidance documents. Of course, also already in the process, the co-legislators, you can see a very clear effort to improve the clarity of the text so that when you read the legal text, you can already have the map interpretation. Um, I just wanted like one last point I had um, on the reporting, um, just also to reassure everyone that we do not at all have the intention to to create like a stash of valuable uh, vulnerabilities. So the, the sort of information that will be reported will be rather high level. It would be more information useful to those people that um, mitigate um, risk such as the C certs, right? So a C cert does not need to receive a proof of concept of a vulnerability in order to understand whether it can have a negative impact on critical infrastructure or not, right? You need much, much less information than that. So what we want is only that kind of information that can help C certs take uh, do risk assessments and potentially take further measures, give advice to critical infrastructure and so forth, and. Um, I mean, the vulnerabilities that we're looking for, that's a very, very narrow subset of all the vulnerabilities out there, right? It's not even all unpatched vulnerabilities, and it really shouldn't be all unpatched vulnerabilities. It's really only those that are already being exploited by malicious actors, yeah? We're only talking about vulnerabilities that are already known for criminals. So all we want is that we put the C-search at an equal footing with the criminals, right? That's all we want. And um, yeah, so I think this is really limited and nothing to be afraid of in terms of cybersecurity because the information will not be valuable even if it got out of hand because it will be valuable. I, I think, I, yeah, so, so well, well, I absolutely agree with, with the sentiment and that going in the right direction. I, I think the, 
like experience in the last like 20 years of, of, of doing this, this, this has learned is that um, even the very fact that uh, a security hole may exist in a certain package or a version number or the fact that it reappeared at a certain date or something like that, uh, because yeah, because the source code is open, has has often led to sort of like inadvertent leaks or or basically reconstruction of what the issue was by a much wider set of criminals than than, than the useful set you, you you were dealing with. So I mean, I think that no matter how we spin this, it, it, it will will it basically it remains incredibly uh, yeah sensitive information where where yeah it's very easy to to often sort of like reconstruct things even if, if the version numbers are hidden. There is a balance we struggle with. Yeah, there's a balance. But, yeah. uh, that's true. I mean, I don't deny that. But at the same time, I mean, why would we allow state sponsored actors yeah, to have access to information and our own CISO should not have access to that information? There is, I feel, this, I feel like there, there is a full, maybe a full day workshop that should be planned, especially on this. There's this interesting question of the commission, of course, being open to having the meetings. I've said this several times, Benjamin, I saw you at Fostum, which is a great sign here in Brussels just for the commission reaching out to the community. But there is still this element of getting the, these bridges and meetings because, of course, a the open source ecosystem is not represented by a trade association. That's just not how it works, let's say, in the multi-stakeholderism of the model of, of the EU. And I think, just like Denlef said, there's a lot in the diverse open source ecosystem to reach out and have those conversations. And the European Commission has built an open source program office, an interface to engage with open source ecosystem. But this ENISA does not have one. Should it have one? Probably. You know, there are all these other institutional interfaces that I think also the European governments and institutions need to build to be able to engage. It is simply different um, in terms of uh, uh, engaging with an ecosystem. Because how else could the Commission reach out to all of these different stakeholders. I think there's going to be a massive discussion in the coming years in terms of how to communicate essentially the point that you're making, uh, Benjamin, out to this ecosystem. Because it seems to me that we found ourselves in this situation because those approaches that were in place didn't work. And I think we're, we're called that. And, and I think equally challenging and, and almost more urgent is to make sure that all those standards which have to be written, which basically CRA postulates as, as, as going to be conjured into existence, yeah, that they, those basically sort of like are written well and informed by what the IT industry needs, with the big, big sort of like caveat that the IT industry as a whole, especially the, the, the IT industry which deals with the internet and web services and SaaS and things like that, and cloud, um, has generally sort of like never participated in, in, in sort of like the typical standards organization like ISO and Etsy and so on. Uh, they, they basically centered around the, the, the ITF and WCC and, 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 and NIST. Uh, so, so that, that community is, is yeah, not only hard to reach, it's also completely unaccustomed to yeah, the type of standards which would be the, the natural ones for, for, for Europe to use. I mean, they're, they're entirely sort of like different worlds. Uh, so that, that's, I think, make, makes the challenge even harder to sort of like not only connect that world, but also connect them to the, to the right standards organizations. Mm -hmm. But we have a few months to fix this. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, and before we get it, because I threw Peter under the bus to say something, I think it's worth, there's the, like some groups in this ecosystem that haven't been mentioned. Then, sorry, we'll, we'll, we'll have some time, I think we'll go a bit over time. But Peter, just describe these two points. Like, what does a code repository do? And what does a, uh, like a package manage? Like, what is it? And why does it matter? Thanks, Mr. Yeah, so, uh, I think Jochen kind of introduced the yeah, EPS that um, his first question, some helpful points here. So I'm from GitHub, uh, and GitHub is a public code repository, enables uh, developers to collaborate, um, host the code, um, and then we also manage uh, the NPM package manager, which enables folks to uh, access the compiled code once you've collaborated on it. So I would Carefully not use the word distribute, because I think it's kind of important to emphasize that we're not an app store that's distributing a final product, but instead enabling a collaboration both on the source code level and the compiled binaries. And I want to ask you a question, I think, um, uh, where it, in your remarks you can make this distinction between uh, an individual or an entity that's taking a component, integrating it into the product, and understanding that. 
the responsibility, not liability, lives at that bar. Um, and I'm not sure how intentional that distinction was. It's kind of reassuring in my mind, but I'm a little concerned that a lot of the discussion has been focused on uh, the Department of Council on uh, components having to be compliant as well. Uh, and in particular, if that is the focus, uh, GitHub and package manager goes from that side of our ecosystem, I think we'd be quite concerned if we were to need to maintain or understand that any individual piece of software that's hosted on our platform is keeping from the individual application because that would prevent us from allowing folks to actually upload something seamlessly that you can collaborate on. So we'd love if you could elaborate on the intent of the commission to address the components. Um, yes, I mean, we definitely do want to cover components by the cyber resilience act. Yeah? The idea is that many components, I mean, open source is of course a bit special, but many components are black boxes, right? And it's extremely hard to evaluate for, for an integrator, it's extremely hard to evaluate their security, sometimes even impossible if you think of microchips, right? I mean, that's literally, I mean, that's basically impossible to evaluate for someone that integrates them. Uh, but even for uh, Software components that may be open source, it may have, or at least the source code is, is openly available. It is, of course, much more easy for the person that wrote the original code to understand the security properties of that code than for an integrator, right? If I am an SME, a very small company, and I integrate lots of components into my project, it's, of course, extremely difficult to go through each and every of these components and understand the security uh, features of the component, right? So this is the rationale behind covering components. We understand, of course, that components, like the security posture of a component changes depending on which environment it is integrated. That's just clear to us, of course. But at the same time, there are, of course, I mean, there are certain vulnerabilities that are vulnerabilities almost irrespective of where the component is integrated, right? So there is a case to be made to fix those vulnerabilities already at component level. And just a quick question, and maybe you could answer this, and this is just uh, me, me kind of responding to that. In terms of, you said, of course, yeah, there are many black box proprietary components, that's fine. But in terms of just components in general, if you think of like percentages here, this comes back to this question of the CRE being about open source first. Yes. The screws you're talking about. Yeah, the yeah. so uh, uh, let's talk about components. Uh, everybody has uh, seen this topic with Log4j. I'm pretty sure everybody's aware. I'm not complaining anybody, but it's known. Nobody, or most of the, I would say 99.99% did not develop the code, but used it. It's a component. It's a part of a library. So to get the fix, it was required to get the fix for this component, and then integrating the fixed component in uh, your own solutions. So when this vulnerability came up at Bosch, it was a complete scan across the entire organization. And to be honest, it took a certain amount of time, uh, more than it should have been, to be honest. Uh, but we checked all the com uh, products which this component are in, and then draw corresponding measures to fix it in the final product. So this is a task, and therefore the components are relevant, definitely. But uh, that is the reason why we are typically using open source, which is, which is well maintained. If we are uh, looking for, uh, if somebody is coming up with an open source component and wants simply to build it in into a product, this is not working in our company. But to be honest, our company is a quite big company and can afford to do all this analysis and everything. We have all these stable processes in place. But for smaller companies, I would say KMUs or uh, something like this, this could become a real, real big challenge. Huh? But but now, again, I emphasize, our company is fully liable for the products, including the screws, including the component, software components. Therefore, if we have an issue with a software component coming from somewhere else, either open source or from a third party or whatsoever, finally we are liable. And if we got the code uh, or the, the software from a third party, then we have to get into negotiation with the third party. For example, if a recall is coming on 
uh, based on this topic, we need to uh, check with our um, uh, supplier how he will compensate to some amount uh, with regard to the recall. But we cannot uh, put all the burden of a vehicle recall to a screw manufacturer. Or especially if the screw manufacturer gives the screws away for free. No, oh, this is not happening because there is material involved. <laughs> yeah. The material costs are high. Right. Yeah, and so, so I think it's important to just stress that in all of those cases, it is that, that final ending basis on the market which, which sells it, who, who basically is liable. So um, it is fair to say <coughs> that if you're a very small company and you've used loads and loads and loads of open source and you, you haven't really bothered to check it or do anything on it and you just use random stuff from GitHub, uh, whatever, I mean, and, and um, then yes, I mean, under the CRA or, or even like today, you, sh you should be having a problem because you're basically, uh, uh, yeah, you're like, like a, I don't know, a, a company making toys which are a little bit poisonous because you just pick any random paint, right? Yes, I mean, of yeah. course, we, <laughs> as a society, we don't want that. Uh, so, so yes, I mean, I think that one of the hard bits to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to, to the whole IT industry is that, that, yes, I mean, you need to get your act together and that, that, isn't, that isn't going to be free. Um, but you still sort of like, and, and also like if you are that small company which, which is selling that whole stack, uh, and of course there is a whole ecosystem of, of, of companies that support open source uh, or that, that basically provide uh, packages of it. I mean, there's a whole, yeah, there, there's basically uh, yeah, a whole industry which basically uh, uh, caters to that. So I, I just want to say, because I, again, I don't for some reason have a clock, but I was going to say, I think we're, I noticed some people leaving, so I bet we're solidly over time. What I would propose, because I've already told some people, the ones who still want to discuss these things, let's eat up the rest of the breakfast that we have here, because otherwise it's going to go onto my desk, and then we're going to have a lot of things I'll just eat all day. Um, but okay, Ian, last point, and then if it's a really tricky question, we'll have to move it over there. That's right. Yes, I just wanted to mention many of the issues that you have talked about today also come up with the AI Act. Although the although that was a much more focused on what it's placed on the market, the council and especially the parliament, especially since ChatGPT basically have had so much attention in the media, have also been debating, well, do we do we need to regulate more upstream in effect, you know, in the, yeah, the language you were using? And might that affect open source software? And I, don't, I don't know how closely you've been following that debate, but maybe it's something we can discuss over coffee as well. Or maybe it's uh, yet another breakfast event that we'll have to have in, 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 in coming weeks or months. Well, so just to round this off, thank you so much for coming. That left a wheel. Thank you so much for, for coming. We'll continue the discussions like we've said. There's quite some time pressure. There was one question. Oh, we have a question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, there was a slight objection. Uh, when it comes to liability and responsibility, in the end, it's a regulation. So there are legal obligations. So it's a product safety regulation, yeah. classic product safety regulation. So all those, all economic operators, developers, I, 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 I uh, work for Developers Alliance, we are advocating for software developers. So all software developers will be in the scope of the regulation, we have a legal obligation. On top of that, it's the product liability that is imposing a strict liability regime on all types of software, embedded, non-embedded. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite worrisome from our point of view. But that's irrespective of the CRA. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, but the CRA it's provides a lot more rope. Report, if you have the product, a piece of software that you see is certified, then the court takes that into account because it's so it's a market access. It's a market access. Yeah, we are not supposed to put anything into the market that is not compliant with the rules. Exactly. So the board always takes that into account. It's a presumption of conformity. Yeah. So that's a good thing, right? It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Yeah, no, it's a good thing. It's there. It is a connection, and uh, finally, mentioned the time, uh, a ripple effect in the end, it would be on price of software in Europe, and that would be in the consumer wallets. And I think just to kind of tying it all together, or at least trying to, um, 
Um, like Ben Newman said, there's the CRA, but there are other, you know, separating it from, let's say, the PLD, but also like Ian referred to the AI Act. I mean, in my view, essentially what we're, what we're talking about here, which is quite obvious, I think, for anyone involved, the software market is being regulated. Um, elements are starting in Europe, other things we'll see elsewhere, but we don't have those bridges and conversations in place yet properly to have the open source conversation. It hasn't been sorted out. And I think it takes two to tango. I think we've concluded that and we need to, um, I think the, uh, the general open source ecosystem and the diverse many different organizations need to step up, mature their thinking and approaches to, let's say the European Commission, national governments, regulators, etc. But I also think um, uh, that there's, you know, there are some early steps from the commission building uh, the, the open source program office, but also building the institutional capacity to take in the massive diversity because when we talk about regulating software, it's about open source first. I think that's an important thing to conclude. Um, and it might require more attention than a recital. Thank you very much. Let's go out and get some coffee. I really implore you to get some coffee. I need some more, more, uh, more croissants. But thank you very much for coming and we'll continue the conversation. <laughs>